Welcome. I'm Michael Markowitz. I'm director of the New School Institute for Retired Professionals. We will be taping this program today for showing on the New School Station. So I would like you to get settled in and be very aware of the fact that there's a camera over there if you have to leave or exit and not stand in front of the camera and uh, freeze, just move. Uh, I also ask you to disable any electronic devices you might have uh, with you. Seven months ago, I called together eight IRP students and asked them the question, how, if at all, the IRP should mark the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. They thought it was important to look at the event and its consequences. They considered the question, and several study groups will be offered in the next two years, and others are being considered. Today's Playful Voices by Walter Wegline is the first response to the question I asked at the start of the year. Although it is a radio play, you in the studio audience will see special visual effects as we take you back to the year 1860. Our cast includes the author, Walter Wegline, John Becker, Joe Zuckerman, and Linda Friedman, all students in the Institute for Retired Professionals, and this is their response to the question that I raised. After the performance, there will be a discussion period with members of the cast and comments and questions from the audience. Finally, refreshments will be served. Thank you. What you are about to see and hear is a play for voices. I am a narrator. This is the story of a drama that played out just 150 years ago and within a short distance from where we are right now. What happened in 1860 in New York made Lincoln president. Had it not happened, Lincoln would have spent the rest of his life, probably a longer life, as a lawyer and probably a very rich man. Billy's the name, Billy Herndon. I was Mr. Lincoln's best friend, I like to believe, and his law partner. In October 1859, he came rushing into the office in Springfield one morning with a letter from New York City inviting him to deliver a lecture there. He asked my advice and that of other friends as to subjects and character of his address. We all recommended a speech on the political situation, that being the only thing people wanted to hear about. He fixed a date and laid up February as the most convenient time for him. Besides, it would give him a chance to visit his son, Bob, who was in school in Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. He spent the intervening time in careful preparation. He searched through dusty volumes of congressional proceedings in the state library and dug deeply into political history. We could only wonder what effect the unpretentious lawyer would have on the wealthy and fashionable folks of the largest city in America. No effort in the line of speech making had ever cost Lincoln so much time and thought as this one. On his return home from New York and nine stops in New England two weeks later, Lincoln told me that for once in his life, he was ashamed about his personal appearance. He imagined that the audience and the fancy people on the stage were upset by his ill-fitting garments crumpled from two-day railway trip 
east, and by the way, the collar of his coat on the right side kept flying up whenever he raised his arms to gesticulate. Mason Judd's the name. I was the Illinois state leader of the New Republican Party, and I was in New York in December 59 to attend the Republican National Committee meeting in the Astor House, a grand hotel across from New York City Hall. At the bidding of Mr. Lincoln, I had pressed the committee to hold its presidential convention in May 1860 in Chicago. Although nobody said so, it was my way to make sure Lincoln had a chance to win the nomination away from that famous New York Senator and former governor, William Seward, the odds on favorite. Seward's backers had no objection to Chicago, figuring it didn't matter wherever the convention was held. Once we got to Chicago in May, however, the entire Illinois delegation would be pledged to Lincoln, and we soon worked out a lot of other Midwest states to come around for him. Being a railway lawyer like Abe, I got the railway companies to provide cheap excursion fares from all parts of the state, so a whole lot of Lincoln supporters could attend. The first impression of a stranger entering New York City is that it was built the night before. <laughs> what was not under construction seemed about to be torn down. Everything and everyone appeared to be in perpetual motion. It is a village without boundaries, eating up the countryside as it needs room for more houses and more stores, explained a French visitor. Like many tourists, the writers also found the city mean and repellent, marred by the broken pavement, the muddy streets, the parks full of weeds and briars, the horse-drawn omnibuses, clumsy wagons that roll on iron tracks, the irregularly placed houses, mottled with enormous posters, all of it exuding the neglected ugliness of an open-air bazaar. From the Astor House, Lincoln could clearly see a number of familiar landmarks. Just across the street to the south was George Washington's church, St. Paul's, erected back in 1764, ancient by Manhattan standards. Just to the north stood the 49-year-old City Hall, that handsome combination of Renaissance facade and federal-style detailing that the noted architect Benjamin Latrobe had undeservedly ridiculed as a vile, heterogeneous composition. Southeast across City Hall Park huddled another newspaper row. Fifty dailies and weeklies massed inside imposing brick towers. This was the opinion-making capital of the country where a line or two of press coverage in one of the powerful papers meant instant recognition among tens of thousands of voting readers. The Tribune alone claimed a national readership approaching 200,000, The Sun as many as 65,000, and The Times describing itself as the youngest of the daily newspapers in the city boasted on the very day that Lincoln arrived in town that it had quickly equaled its strongest rivals in readership and become one of the most widely known and most firmly established daily journals of the United States. James Gordon Bennett's Herald tilted Democratic, as did the News, whose editor was the mayor's own brother. These papers did not much matter to Abraham Lincoln, their hostility was to be expected. And the Times, as the voracious newspaper reader from Illinois surely knew, had just reiterated its unwavering support for New York Senator Seward for president, warning on February 22nd that the Republican Party can only be defeated by defeating the nomination of William H. Seward at the National Convention. As for the Tribune's Horace Greeley, Although he had met Lincoln back in 1847, he recalled him as unremarkable except for his height. For now, Lincoln walked through the streets of New York entirely unrecognized. 
an expensively dressed pedestrian such as he was, making his way through Manhattan in the winter, would find himself knee deep in mud, even on supposedly glamorous Broadway. But the most skeptical visitor had to admit that there is no other street like it, even in its present unfinished condition. Northeast of City Hall was the mother of all slums, the infamous Five Points, a confluence of squalid streets and decaying, overcrowded buildings erected on fetid swampland and now occupied by impoverished Irish immigrants, destitute African Americans, violent thieves, and prostitutes. Boston lawyer Richard Henry Dana Jr. had described it as a sink of iniquity and filth. But like other visitors before him, including Charles Dickens, he had been strangely attracted to its horrors. As curious as the others, Lincoln would soon follow them there shortly, as we will see. All of New York, well-to-do and destitute alike, was expanding rapidly too rapidly, some feared. Over the past 10 years, the population had swelled from just over 515,000 to over 800,000. The city now housed 2.5% of the entire United States population and was home to more people than all but 12 of the other 34 states. More than 300,000 of its population was foreign born more than half of these were immigrants from Ireland, and most were working for minuscule wages as unskilled jobs, if they were working at all. In politics, New York leaned Democratic, in regional sympathies, Southern. Lucrative trade with the slaveholding states, seasoned with intractable racism, combined to make much of the city hostile to Republicans, and reformers alike, not to mention radical abolitionists. Free blacks in New York, by and large, strove to remain invisible in order to be safe from recent European immigrants competing for menial jobs. As one Englishman noted, the black man constituted a race apart, never walking in company with white persons except as servants. Competitive, brawling, noisy, dirty, frightening, expensive, or inspiring, revolting. New York in 1860 was simply the best place in America to get published, get rich, get lost, or get noticed. <laughs> Arriving at the Astor House, the stone palace famous for its interior courtyard and indoor plumbing, Lincoln checked into a small room on the office or ground floor along the South Corridor. It probably rented at a cost of $2 or $2.50 a night on the American plan, meals included. Like many hotels in town, the Astor House was packed with guests, few of whom, however, would have sympathized with Lincoln. The season of Southern Spring trade had begun in New York and cotton merchants from Virginia, Georgia, and the Carolinas were everywhere. In town to make new friends, Lincoln would ironically find himself living among future enemies. I'm Henry McCormick. As a representative of the Young Men's Central Republican Union in New York, I led a delegation to officially welcome Mr. Lincoln on the morning of the day he was to deliver his Cooper Union speech, Monday, February 27. We priced tickets for that evening at 25 cents and hoped for a full house. As it later turned out, it was snowing and house was less than three quarters full, so we had to take a loss of about $100. At any rate, we picked up Mr. Lincoln in his room at the Astor House, the very place where Chicago was picked for the convention two months earlier, and took him for a walk up Broadway. When we got to number 643, the corner of Bleecker Street, we walked into the temporary quarters where the celebrated photographer Matthew Brady had moved while his gallery at Broadway and 10th Street was being renovated. In the studio was the famous historian George Bancroft, 
I introduced Lincoln to him, and the two chatted briefly. I was struck by the co contrast in their appearances. The one, courtly and precise in his every word and gesture. The other, bluff and awkward, his every utterance as apology for his ignorance of metro manners and customs. He was only 51 years old, but he looked haggard and careworn. He was six foot four, his ears were large, his nose long and blunt, his cheeks flabby, and the loose skin fell in folds. There was a mole on his right cheek and a huge Adam's apple on his throat. Brady responded to the challenge with an inspiration. He would not settle for a commonplace close-up headshot. He would move his camera as far away from this homely looking man as possible. Instead, he would emphasize, rather than disguise, his subject's greatest attribute, his soaring height. For the first time in his life, Lincoln would be asked to pose standing up rather than sitting down. He could do nothing about his short sleeves, but books piled up in a fall pillow pillar would add grandeur to the scene. The result was a work of art. His image was immortalized in all its raw frontier vigor just hours before he was to deliver the most important speech of his career. The picture would become a legend and recognized by voters all over the country before the November election. By year's end, adaptations of the portrait appeared around the country and in France and England as well. Lincoln looked nothing like the Cooper Union photograph by then, inspired by a letter from a little girl in upstate New York who wrote to complain that his clean shaven face looked, quote, too thin, close quote, Lincoln began to grow whiskers shortly after his election. His young, his young correspondent had been inspired after seeing a campaign poster at a country fair featuring a crude engraving of the Brady photograph. Thus, the picture that in effect introduced Lincoln's face to the public was nothing like the face the world would know soon. How Lincoln spent the rest of the day before the Cooper Union talk remained a mystery to most historians. However, I knew the answer. I'm Len Smathers, a reporter for the New York Times. What happened was that on the way back to his hotel across Broadway from City Hall, Lincoln walked down adjacent Park Row to visit the newspapers. In particular, Horace Greeley's Tribune. He also stopped to see my boss, Henry Raymond. After the speech, people wondered how it got into the papers late that night in its entirety. In fact, the Times ran the whole thing on the front page. As far as I can tell, that had never happened before. In those days, the few people in New York who had ever heard of Lincoln took him for some kind of country bumpkin. In fact, he was a very crafty lawyer and politician, and he certainly knew his way around the Illinois newspapers. What I think he did that day was go see Horace Greeley at the Tribune. Greeley was on the outs with the famous Senator Seward, the odds-on favorite to win the Republican nomination in May, because Seward had always refused to consider him for a government job. So he welcomed Lincoln, asked him for his handwritten manuscript, and promised to return it to him in time for his address. He did better than that. He gave him printed galley proofs, which made it a lot easier for Lincoln, with his bad eyesight, to read his speech at Cooper Union. Meanwhile, somehow the galley proofs also wound up at the offices of the Times, Gordon Bennett's Herald, and William Cullen Bryant's Evening Post, because they all ran the speech verbatim the next day. I'm a Cormick. Lincoln had one final mission before going over to Cooper Union from his hotel that evening. He wandered over to the Knox Great Hat and Cap establishment at 212 Broadway, corner of Fulton, and bought a top hat. His suit was ill-fitting and creased, his stiff new boots cramped by his feet, but at least he would look taller than any man in the city when he donned his new stove pipe topper and headed up to Cooper Union. I loved the Great Hall at Cooper Union. When it opened the year before, I'd written in the Times that it could not be equaled by any room of similar nature in the city or the US. On that platform were 18 men, among them were Horace Greeley, determined to dump Seward, 
and the man who introduced Lincoln, poet and editor William Cullen Bryant. The speaker's towering stature stirred loud and prolonged applause and a few gasps as well. Mr. Lincoln began his address in a low monotone. As he advanced, his quaint but clear voice rang out boldly and distinctly enough for all to hear. His manner was to a New York audience a very strange one, but it was captivating. He held a vast meeting spellbound, and as one by one his oddly expressed but trenchant arguments confirmed the accuracy of his political conclusions, the House broke out in wild and prolonged enthusiasm. I think I never saw an audience more carried away by an orator. As far as I could tell, he set some ambitious goals for his first public words in New York. First, as a newcomer from the West, he had to demonstrate his historical and legal acumen to buttress his oppositions to slavery and show he was a thoughtful statesman, not a yokel from the West. Also, he had to present himself as the principal alternative to Senator Seward's vision that the country faced a rebellion over the issue of slavery. True enough, as it soon turned out. He had separated himself from Seward's negative fatalism. This would require him to present himself more electable than Seward and more moderate than his own house divided speech of the year before made him appear. At the same time, he needed to seize the high moral ground that slavery was wrong. In sum, he had to defeat two formidable potential opponents at the same time. Seward, the prevailing Republican favorite for his party's nomination, and Douglas, the presumptive Democratic nominee in the general election. Let me try to summarize and explain as briefly as possible what Lincoln did in his 90-minute oration. The facts with which I shall deal this evening are mainly old and familiar, nor is there anything new in the general use I shall make of them. If there shall be any novelty, it will be in the mode of presenting the facts. Notice the two words, the facts. Thus, he immediately informs his audience that his speech will be an appeal to the mind, not to the heart. It will be an examination of right and wrong. In other words, everything is incontrovertible. Beyond Cavell. Then he goes on to quote his bêtoise, Stephen A. Douglas. He says the founding fathers understood the question of slavery just as well as people do today. And then he drops the bombshell. He goes on to show that slavery was doomed from the outset by the nation's founders themselves. By that, he meant not the signers of the Declaration of Independence, but by the framers of the Constitution 11 years earlier. Remember, Douglas is the soon to be named Democratic candidate for president, the name who will ultimately be Lincoln's main opponent. Only nobody in the hall had the slightest inkling that the awkward figure before them will be the Republican candidate. Douglas has stated that it will be up to the new states being carved out of the land west of the Mississippi River whether to decide or not what they want, whether they want slavery. Not so, declares Lincoln. He cites proof. He says that the great majority of the Constitution's drafters actually opposed the extension of slavery beyond the borders of the states where it already existed in 1789. His argument, of course, is diametrically opposed to Douglas. Now he goes on to address, quote, the Southern people, if they would listen, as I suppose they will not, unquote, of course, he is really not addressing Southerners who are not there, but his audience, trying to make them think that if Southerners were there and would only listen, he could convince them of the wrongness of their beliefs. No, he says, the Constitution's framers did not want slavery beyond the states already established. 
Demolishing Douglas and the Democrats' arguments that slavery could be extended to new states, Lincoln closes with a desire for all parts of the country to remain at peace and in harmony. He argues fellow Republicans to do our part to have it so, even if provoked. Let us do nothing through passion and ill temper. Try to find ways to conciliate, he concludes. If slavery is right, all words, acts, laws, and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away. If it is right, we cannot justly object to its nationality, its universality. If it is wrong, they cannot justly insist upon its extension, its enlargement. All they ask, we could readily grant if we thought slavery right. All we ask, they could as readily grant if they thought it wrong. They are thinking it right, and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy. Thinking it wrong as we do, can we yield to them? Can we cast our votes with their view and against our own? In view of our moral, social, and political responsibilities, can we do this? Can we, while our votes will prevent it, allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in these free states. If our sense of duty forbids this, then let us stand by our duty, fearlessly and effectively. Let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances, such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong, such as a policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. After the speech, which won great applause and cheers, my friend James Briggs told the audience that time will soon tell whether the gallant son of Kentucky, who was reared in Illinois, and whom you have heard tonight, shall be the standard bearer in the fight. The deepest of dark horses just 24 hours earlier, he was now being touted as a rival to Seward in Seward's own backyard. The Times' Henry Raymond crowned him a national figure. Overnight, he became New York State's second choice for the presidential nomination. He had conquered New York. Letter to Mary Todd Lincoln from her husband, March 4th, 1860, Exeter, New Hampshire. When I wrote you earlier, I was just starting out from New York on a little speech-making tour, taking the boys, his son Bob and a friend, with me. Coming to Exeter, where Bob went to school, there was a letter from you saying Willie and Teddy were very sick the Saturday after I left. I trust the dear little fellows are well again. This is Sunday morning, and on Bob's order, I am to go to church once today. Tomorrow I bid farewell to the boys and go to Hartford and speak there that evening, just a week after Cooper Union. Tuesday, Merrick, Wednesday at New Haven, Thursday at Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Then I start home, and I think I shall not stop. I may be delayed at New York City, an hour or two. I have been unable to escape this toil. If I had foreseen it, I think I would not have come east at all. The speech in New York went of passably well and gave me no trouble whatsoever. The difficulty was to make nine others. Before reading audiences who have already seen my ideas in print. I hope to be home tomorrow week once started, I shall come as quick as possible. Kiss the dear boys for father. Affectionately, Abe Lincoln. The only satisfaction the weary politician found that day, aside from the constant reminders that he was still very much in demand, came with a receipt of a letter waiting for him in his son's quarters at Exeter from his Cooper Union host, James Briggs, consisting of a check for $200, Lincoln's honorarium and expenses for his New York visit. 
Before heading off to church with his son, Lincoln wrote Briggs. Since I left New York, I have spoken at Providence, Rhode Island, and at Concord, Manchester, Dover, and Exeter in New Hampshire, and I am still to speak in four other New England locations. Then I start for home. I beg of you that you will make me no arrangements to detain me in New York. I must hurry home. He didn't quite get his wish. Hailed wherever he went in New York, in New England, he was mobbed by the crowds who heard him repeat what he had already read, what they had already read, his Cooper Union remarks, which ran in all the Eastern papers. This was in the days before a sports spectacle swept the country. Politics was the only national pastime. Two weeks after first arriving there, he was back in the Astor House in New York, utterly exhausted. He attended Sunday worship services where he had two weeks before, the respected Henry Ward Beecher's Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights. The Reverend Beecher thought that Lincoln's Cooper Union speech had all but settled the search for a Republican candidate for president. Hiram Barney is my name. I'm one of the young Republicans who had greeted Mr. Lincoln when he first arrived. On his last day in town, we paid a visit to Five Points. It was so awful that it had become a kind of tourist attraction. Some of us had opened a charity mission there named Paradise Square for 150 abused children. He spoke to a Sunday school class and mightily impressed the little tykes. I said as much. He replied, no. They're the ones who have inspired me and given me courage. I'm glad we came. I shall never forget this as long as I live. It was very touching, a man who had grown up amid terrible squalor. Billy Herndon. Lincoln's return after his dazzling success in the East was the signal for earnest congratulations on the part of his friends. Seward was a great man of the day, but Lincoln had demonstrated to the satisfaction of his friends that he was tall enough and strong enough to measure swords with, swords with the upstate New York statesman. His triumph in New York City and New England made it clear to Lincoln that the presidential nomination was within his reach. His success had stimulated his confidence to new heights. He had no political organization or money. Seward had all these things. But Lincoln had the Cooper Union speech. Within weeks, it was reprinted in pamphlet form and distributed all over the country, along with the pictures taken by Brady. An unknown had become very much a known practically overnight. He wrote letters to people like a Republican friend in Kansas whose name he would not want to tell me. Quote, if you shall be appointed a delegate to New York, to, to Chicago, it said, I will furnish $1,000 to bear the expenses of the trip, unquote. His eye was constantly fastened on New York Seward as the leader of the party. All other competition did not matter. I have to tell you, though, something about Lincoln's weaknesses. The Kansas man was not appointed delegate, having lost out to a Seward man. Nevertheless, Lincoln kept his promise. He not only paid the man to come to Chicago, but he appointed him a federal, to a federal judgeship after he became president. Just before the Republican convention started on May 17th, in a monster building erected for the occasion and called the Wigwam, Harper's Weekly put on a large engraving of the 10, 11 leading candidates with Seward's portrait in the middle and the others clustered around him like they were constellations orbiting and around the sun, and he, Seward, was the sun. The next day, a wildly cheering crowd of Lincoln backers packed the wigwam, and the voting commenced. 
On the first ballot, Seward got 173 and a half votes. Lincoln came in second with 102. The big shocks were Lincoln's strong showing and Seward's failure to get close to the 233 required votes and that New Hampshire where Lincoln had spent so much time touring with his son voted seven to one for Lincoln over Seward. Connecticut, New York's neighbor, gave Lincoln two votes and Seward none. Well, it kept getting better for Abe. On the second ballot, Seward gained only 11 votes while Lincoln added 79. On the third ballot, as Lincoln moved to within one and a half votes of the nomination, Ohio switched four votes to him and Bedlam blasted through the wigwam. Down in Springfield, Lincoln was sitting in the offices of the Springfield Journal when the Associated Press Telegraph reported the vote. All he did was calmly stand up and say, I must go tell the little lady down the street the news. Smathers, I was in Chicago for the convention. When I got back to the Times office in New York, Henry Raymond and I realized that a Lincoln victory at the general election was inevitable since the Democrats had split into northern and southern factions headed by Douglas and John Breckinridge of Kentucky, respectively. On November 7th, 1860, exactly 150 years ago, in less than three weeks, nearly 4.7 million white men went to the polls, a remarkable 80% of those eligible. Lincoln, whose name did not even appear on Southern ballots, won less than 40% of the popular vote nationwide and yet he managed to capture majority of all electoral votes. Douglas got just 12 in New Jersey and Missouri. In the states Lincoln had visited on his trip east, he got nearly 55% of all votes cast in the nation. McCormick. In New York, he won the state's electoral votes and clinched the election. Without New York State's vital 35 electoral votes, the election would have been thrown into the House. Remarkably, he won the state even though Douglas got far more votes than he did in New York City. In other words, Lincoln won the state even though he lost the city that was home to Cooper Union where his speech had made him a nationally recognized figure. Strange and ironic. Had it not been for Cooper Union, Lincoln would have been a man little known nor long remembered outside Illinois. A little more than five weeks after the election, South Carolina seceded from the Union and we were on the road that led to the bloodiest war in American history. End of play. <laughs> Of you who don't know him, uh, a young fellow at the lectern is our author, Walter Wegelin. Now it can be told. I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, seriously, folks, as they say, uh, this was a, a really remarkable story, and I thought that it, it ought to be told. Uh, some of you may know, uh, I gave a, court, a course on Lincoln, I don't know, got four or five years ago. And uh, just at this time, when this Cooper Union event took place, we all trooped over to the Great Hall at Cooper Union and heard Sam Waterston from the stage. Well, he wasn't there, but the, the audio was. And we heard the creaking of the floorboards and everything. Uh, deliver this uh, this very speech. So enjoy it. Well, thank you. <laughs> Before uh, we forget, there were some thank yous to get in. Uh, first to the new school for the uh, for setting us up today with all the equipment we needed for the instruction uh, on the use of the computer that they provided, including at one of our rehearsals. 
and also to uh, Virginia Mayer in our office and to Miriam Lawrence for the uh, helping to guide us through the bureaucratic maze. And there is such a maze. Now we want to hear from you. This is the discussion period. Uh, uh, before, before we get to that, just, just one tiny little thing, and it's not so tiny. This book, this book, Lincoln at Cooper Union, was really the, 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 the wellspring of um, the information uh, that you found in this play. Uh, that plus, uh, of course, Billy Herndon's biography and uh, other sources as well. It's by Harold Holzer, H-O-L-Z-E-R, and I recommend it to anyone who enjoys this kind of uh, information. Uh, Miriam, uh, on this side, stage left, and uh, Linda is going to be getting that microphone over there to bring the mic to you uh, for your questions and comments. So uh, let's begin. And Mike, oh, sorry, before we begin, yes. joining us on the panel for the discussion is uh, Michael Marsh, one of our IRP students and also a docent at the New York Historical Society, which had an exhibit, was it two years ago or so? A year or so ago on Lincoln in New York. So we're very happy to have Michael uh, with us right here. Let's begin. I'll, I'll ask you a question. Does anything, in, okay, there we go, Donald. Mr. Lincoln had been debating all throughout the country against his notorious buddy. And he's all over the place. Why did the Cooper Union speech, because it was just because it was okay in New York, make him so very important? Uh, it was because of the presence of the national media. New York City was the uh, communications capital of the United States. As Walter so aptly included in his play, you had over 50 newspapers. Uh, of a national consequence. Uh, you also had the dailies, the Harper's Daily, Frank Leslie's, and uh, these newspapers were national newspapers. A communication system had developed using the railroad that within a week's time, which was amazing, that these newspapers could be uh, uh, all over the country. Editors, in small towns would wait for the newspapers and they would then reprint things. So there was a major difference. Even though uh, the historically, to a certain extent, the Lincoln-Douglas Bates are better known, uh, this particular event and the turning of this speech into a pamphlet, along with the famous photo taken by Matthew Brady, were the major uh, uh, campaign elements used by Lincoln, not only to capture the nomination, but also in the campaign. Because what people have to remember is that candidates for president did not campaign in those days. They sat home on the porch. So the pamphlet published by Horace Greeley and the photo, which was then photo engraved and put on buttons, banners, uh, everything, uh, what was was of such such great great importance. Uh, Joe, yeah, I would just like to add one other comment, and that is the debates that Lincoln had with uh, Stephen Douglas were in Illinois, only in the state of Illinois, and many of them were in small towns of Illinois, and they did not get, either singly or in combination, the publicity that flo flowed out of the Cooper Union speech. Jerry. Um, you didn't have to play that before my question. <laughs> the, overture. Uh, overture. The, uh, the question that I have is, is there's been an absolutely amazing uh, three-part series recently on television about the role of religion in the United States and the impact of some of that thinking on Lincoln. And so I'm, I'm wondering, since uh, they were so interested in abolition at that time within the church, 
to what degree did the church play a role in helping further Lincoln's nomination or anything else in relation to this particular uh, speech that was going on? I'll make the first comment and then Michael next. These guys know more than I do, but one of the things that made Lincoln a viable candidate was he was considered less radical on the issue of slavery, even though you heard how he felt about it, than both Seward, the, lead, the leading candidate, and one of the others, Sam and P. Chase, who were considered more radical. And Lincoln made it clear, as much as he felt that slavery was wrong, since it was protected by the Constitution where it existed then, he was not an abolitionist. Now, Michael. Yeah. Uh, the, the importance of religion, uh, and Jerry and I discussed this a little bit before, was the second great awakening uh, that uh, began in about the 1820s. And this religious movement was also a social movement. They were very much against alcohol. Uh, they were for women's rights. Uh, and out of this grew the white abolitionist movement. So there was not one church or, 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 or one group uh, that was advocating this, but, but in a sense, uh, the abolition, abolitionist movement moved from this uh, social concerns of the, uh, of, of the uh, second great uh, awakening. There's also a, a little sidebar on this uh, that I was uh, looking at uh, when I went through my material at the Historical Society. There's a, uh, a telegram from John Briggs, correct? John Briggs? Uh, right. John Briggs. John Briggs, right? And he sends the telegram off to Abe Lincoln, and he invites him to appear in New York uh, on the 29th of November, right. right? He invites him to appear on the 29th of November and to appear at the uh, Reverend Beecher's church because there was gonna be a series of speakers, and he was inviting all the speakers from the West to come to New York to, to tell the East what they think. And Lincoln, as being Lincoln, is late in returning the, uh, the invitation. And he writes Biggs, and he says, I'd love to come, but I'm late in doing this. What about February? Well, it worked out beautifully, because Cooper Union had just been constructed, and they constructed this magnificent auditorium. And Lincoln was the first major speaker there. And it was also in Manhattan, right near the, uh, the, the newspaper, the publishing center. So it worked out well for Lincoln. Right. Uh, Miriam's coming. I'm, I'm interested in why Seward didn't put up a good counterattack. And I'm thinking of possible reasons. Number one, the person out in front, like a Hillary Clinton, tends to be uh, under the opinion that they're, you know, he's, they're not going to catch up. Because there was several vulnerabilities that were glaring about Lincoln. How about lack of experience <laughs> compared to a former governor and a former senator who has international? I don't think Lincoln ever left the uh, shores of the United States. Uh, intellectually, they were, I would say, a match. Seward's brilliant. He's an very intelligent. A human being. I don't know about political savvy. That that could be another issue, where uh, Lincoln would have it. Uh, again, being from New York, that's such a trump card. Whereas uh, Illinois is a great place now, but you know, back in those days, uh, Chicago wasn't the same Chicago. I mean, I can go on and on, but I well, think I think you've answered your own question pretty much. <laughs> uh, Seward and his backers were cocky. It, it was as simple as that. But uh, a very interesting thing, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned in the uh, play or not, uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, he spent, a, well not him, but his backers spent a fortune uh, on railway tickets for, for people all over Illinois to uh, come to the uh, Chicago Convention and of course vote for Lincoln. <laughs> Seward, on the advice of his main political advisor, spent around seven months 
preceding the convention, not in the United States, but in, in Europe, being out of the way here, and he didn't want to uh, you know, antagonize any of the Republicans who he thought, by virtue of his overconfidence, he was going to win. So he didn't attack Lincoln personally. Before Michael speaks, uh, you, uh, this, the man with the question noted several of uh, Seward's uh, abilities and qualities. And even before Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote her book, Team of Rivals, uh, most people uh, knew about the fact that Lincoln himself recognized Seward's great abilities and made him Secretary of State. Uh, there, was, there was another reason, uh, very interestingly, that was one of the reasons why this group of young Republicans uh, invited Lincoln to New York, because they felt that a radical abolitionist Easterner, such as Seward, would not fare well in the West, because the West was so influenced by Southern culture. The other main candidate, Seward's main rival before Lincoln, sort of throws his hat into the ring here in New York and becomes a viable candidate, was Salmon Chase. Salmon Chase from Ohio, another incredibly competent individual, was an avid abolitionist. So they felt that somebody who was a moderate now remember, Lincoln never, never, before he became president, advocated for the abolition of slavery. What he was against was the spread of slavery into the new territories. He was violently opposed to Douglass's concept of popular sovereignty, which would have meant that each state had the ability to decide if they wanted to be free states or slave states. Uh, didn't Chase become uh, Secretary of the Treasury? S yeah. yeah, not only is he Secretary of Treasury, but Lincoln eventually wants to get rid of him, so guess what he appointed him? Supreme. To the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, here comes uh, Linda with the microphone. Could you talk a little bit about how the Republican Party, which was at that time only six years old, uh, was able to get a presidency, mm -hmm. and even before that, uh, why they were so confident, aside from the split? Well, the main issue was the split. Uh, the Democratic Party split into northern and southern wings, and neither of the two wings would, be, would have sufficient uh, electoral uh, uh, votes to carry that candidate to the presidency. So that sort of, uh, that split was the main issue. There was also a fourth candidate. So you had four different candidates running for president in 1860, and Lincoln swept the North with the exception of New Jersey and Missouri, and that was the ball game. Yeah, uh, you see it here. Uh, uh, Breckenridge, Breckenridge, who was uh, the uh, Southern uh, Democrat, right? Uh, then Bell, I don't know where, the, where, where did he Bell? come? Yeah, okay. Bell, Bell was from uh, Tennessee, I think. And he, the, the border states were, were, were looking for a compromise and his party was called the Constitution Union Party. And when Lincoln was nominated by uh, the Republican Party, this so to speak moderate on the issue, uh, his, his, his appeal sort of uh, di diminished. But he was a spoiler. For again, for uh, for for Douglas in in the border states. Any other questions? Come here, uh, right there. Here we go. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> I was thinking about the financial backing that is necessary these days for anyone running for office, 
at that time, was that a particular uh, a point of question? How was money raised for, for Lincoln when, when the party proposed to him uh, to act as for president? I don't think we, uh, Michael? Yeah, the same way it's raised today. <laughs> uh, you know, Lincoln was a politician. Uh, wherever, uh, wherever there were interests who were interested in uh, gaining some sort of leverage with, with somebody who was potentially, uh, p potentially the president of the United States. Uh, the system that we have today is no different from the system that we had years ago. Lincoln was very was a, was a was a railroad lawyer. I'm sure he got tremendous contributions, but it didn't take as much money to run a campaign. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Over there. Uh, uh, would you contrast the Republican National Convention in 1860 with the national? political uh, conventions as we know them now? Well, these days with primaries, um, the, the winner is known before the convention opens in both parties. I mean, the last time you had uh, a ballot that went, more, uh, went to more than one ballot is certainly a couple of decades ago, oh, yeah. at the least. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's the major difference. Here, he, uh, Lincoln won on the third ballot. Um, today, we only go to the end of the primary season, and we know who the winner is going to be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's another point. It's interesting. You say, can you contrast the, this 1860 Republican uh, convention at the Wigwam to you know, a, a Republican convention today or a political convention. The one thing that you have to remember, this was the Republican Party, but the Republican Party was the liberal progressive party of its time. This is a very, very different party. It's not until 1876 that they, be, that, that, that they have this love affair with, uh, with big business. Well, actually, that's kind of interesting since Lincoln was a railroad lawyer and uh, uh, could have been a very wealthy man on his own right. So why, you know, except for the slavery issue, why was he a member of, of a group that uh, was really not uh, a wealthy group? Uh, Lincoln, among many other Republicans, was an ex-Whig. Now, the Whigs uh, were not able to remain united uh, and sort of disappeared in the 1850s. But they were the party that, uh, at least through the 1830s and into the 50s, were very much in favor of a, a more national economy and, and having the federal government support national projects. And as uh, has been mentioned, Lincoln himself supported the uh, railroad interests and, uh, and became and got quite a bit of, uh, got some good fees out of those uh, cases. Uh, any other, uh, we have one over here, yes. Hi. Uh I think you said that he lost New York City, but won New York State. And since my hearing was right, could you explain some of the reasons aside from probably racism, because you also talked about the connection between uh, the business with the South? Mm -hmm. um, New York City was notoriously Southern. I, I think uh, from day one, uh, because it was a port, because it was the shipping place for goods to Europe, uh, all the, well, it was the banking capital, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, they were always pro-Southern, and uh, I think uh, that's the reason. I'd like, I'd like to add something. Um, New York City had a very large Irish immigrant population, and, the, and many of them feared uh, economic competition if the slaves were freed, if the Republicans had done something to free the slaves, and they voted overwhelmingly Democratic as they did in other elections. Yeah, just to follow up on uh, what Walter said, 
Uh, approximately 70 some odd percent of American imports was based upon the cotton exports were based upon the cotton trade. Out of that, I'm trying to get this right now, approximately 30 cents on every dollar stayed in New York City. Because as Walter said, New York City, business community, financial community, shipping community, was uh, so dependent on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the cotton trade. But another interesting thing is, and the enigma of this, is while New York City itself was pro-Democrat, uh, anti-abolition, there was a very strong abolitionist movement here in New York City led by the Tappan brothers, uh, and also the blacks in New York City uh, had their own abolitionist movement going also. So, so you can imagine the confusion that was going on in New York City. But it was a staunchly uh, democratic uh, political uh, bastion. Just a footnote that uh, one of the reporters and an ardent abolitionist who covered Lincoln and became an ardent supporter was Walt Whitman. Oh, yes. Um, who, together with his friend Herman Melville, went to many, many abolitionist movement meetings in New York. And um, Whitman was very impressed with Lincoln. I don't know for a fact that it was because of the Cooper Union speech. I think Lincoln at some point marched through the city or something, didn't he? Didn't he walk through the city? He or walked just, around. Yeah, and I think that's where Whitman, uh, Walt Whitman first became enamored of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as uh, Linda, when she was giving us that description of what New York City was like in those days, uh, as she mentioned, almost any time you would see a white man with a black, the black would be a servant. Uh, as Joe pointed out, there was, uh, in addition to the economic interest, there was a good deal of uh, residual racism in New York City, and slavery was not abolished in New York State until the 1820s. Uh, the other thing is that New York City had uh, uh, de facto segregation. Blacks were, there were separate uh, omnibuses for blacks and whites. Blacks would have to have to stay in the back of the bus. Uh, Jim Crowism was not born in the South, it was born in the North. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Donald. I was a little confused in the Cooper Union speech. He focused most of the speech upon extension of slavery. You, couldn't, you shouldn't take it out of the founding fathers and the others indicated that you're not allowed to take slavery into New, new territories. That was the major part of the speech. And when it came to talking about the blacks themselves, there was elements of ambivalence in terms of his commentary about the blacks, in terms of their, their various qualities mm -hmm. and issues related to it. So I was kind of wondering, was the success of his speech due to the fact that uh, it, it appealed to both sides of it, or despite his comments? I'm urged, the question I'm asking is, yeah. what made his speech successful? Well, let me start off. Uh, you remember that one of our earlier comments was in relation to the question about Seward, why was Lincoln uh, successful? One reason is he was considered the more moderate person on the issue of slavery. He was not an abolitionist. He was, uh, as uh, both uh, Seward and Chase had been, very fervent. You're absolutely right. Uh, the, if you're really interested, you want to Google the Cooper Union speech to see the, it's, it's very long. And we gave you only a little An bit. An hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at that, once you study Lincoln, you know that his feelings on the issue of race, and I'm going to use a word that we might not be able to use if we were in Kansas, his feelings evolved significantly. <laughs> He never thought they would be ready for social equality. But he, by the time the Civil War was ending, he did come to realize that they either would or might be ready for political and civil equality. Now, somebody else. 
I, I, you know, don't you guys fantasize and, and uh, you above all, what if he'd lived? What would life in these United States have been like starting in 1865? Michael, do you have any thoughts on mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like saying if the Pope decided to get bar mitzvahed, what would happen? <laughs> uh, it would be a big affair. <laughs> yeah. I want the catering job on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's because he's Catholic. <laughs> it just seems. It was. Okay. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, a lot of people probably have debated this. Uh, the reason he was killed was because John Wilkes Booth heard him make comments, I think it was public comments, Joe, wasn't it a public speech that he made, where he spoke about giving the right to vote to educated blacks and those who served, who, who were literate and who served in the Union Army. You know, there was a tremendous outpouring of uh, African Americans into the Union Army, which may have tipped the balance. Uh, the, the question would be then, how would Reconstruction have been handled? Uh, my gosh, uh, would it have been a gentler uh, situation? Would he have been able to negotiate with the South on some of these issues? Uh, I, I can't give you uh, anything more than that. I can just point out certain areas. Uh, would he have been in harmony with a radical Republican Congress? I don't know, Joe, take a shot at it. I don't think a radical Republican Congress would have had the same degree of opposition to his moderate positions as to what Reconstruction would, should be like than it had with respect to Andrew Johnson, who was a Democrat to begin with, and who um, the, the day he was inaugurated and gave a speech, he was drunk, didn't go over well um, with the general public. But Lincoln, having won the war, it's a lot harder for the Republicans in Congress, even though they're more radical, more, more pro um, enhancing the position of the, uh, of the freed slaves, they would not have the same degree of power to go against him as they had against Andrew Johnson. I just want to interject a different note uh, briefly. I think this has been very valuable and, uh, and, and thoughtful and so forth, but it's so serious. One thing we almost all know from whatever we learned early about Lincoln is his sense of humor. And I just want to convey one story that might be in the, in the Herndon book, because it comes out of Herndon. Uh, I'm making up a name, Perkins. In this case, uh, a Perkins case, Lincoln is representing a plaintiff in a property dispute. And he and Herndon are in their law office in Springfield, Illinois. And one afternoon, a big burly fellow comes in, walks over to Lincoln, who's at his desk. And he says to Lincoln, I'll give you 50 bucks to drop that Perkins case. Lincoln says nothing, just keeps working. The guy says, I'll give you $100 to drop that Perkins case. Lincoln says nothing, just keeps working. The guy says, I'll give you $200 to drop that Perkins case. Lincoln just keeps working. Then he says, damn it, I'll give you $300 to drop that Perkins case. Upon which Lincoln stands up, grabs him by the collar, drags him to the door, and throws him out. Then he goes back to his desk and resumes work. Herndon says, Abe, what was that all about? Why'd you let that guy keep talking and then throw him out when he said $300? And Lincoln looked up and said to Herndon, he was getting dangerously near my price. <laughs> <laughs> what I just love about that story, whether it's apocryphal, and there's a good chance that it is, it both confirms and spoofs Lincoln's great image of honesty. Okay. Lincoln, yeah, we have a question. I uh, Just rolling back to... Um before the Civil War started. It, I find it so intriguing and, and even a little disturbing to realize that here Lincoln was the most conservative 
of the potential Republican candidates. And even with that being the case, that the South, in effect, seceded the moment he was elected. They didn't even give him a chance. And they, would have, they said they would have already seceded if any Republican was elected. Yeah. Uh, if slavery was confined to the, the southern states, the, the places that, that, that it was, slavery would have died out. And the reason for that is that Virginia was an incubation place for the production of slaves. And there would have been an overabundance of slaves. What would have happened is that the value of slaves would have gone down. Uh, the amount of land that they had to work uh, would have been eventually diminished. And slavery would have expired uh, as, as, an, as an economic uh, entity. But it would have taken a long time. Uh, I want to add. I want to. Oh, go ahead. I want to give a gloss on that. If the southern states could not expand by having additional states, political power, their political power would get diminished every time a new state entered the union. There would be another two senators and one or more congressmen. So the political power of the southern states was doomed. Up until 1850, there was an equal number of southern and northern, uh, northern senators. With 1850, with California, you had two new senators in a non-slave state. And from, that was the first time that that deadlock had been broken. And if you, if you had additional states from these new territories, like Kansas, which was on the verge of becoming a state, and, and Nebraska and places further west, you the political power of the, of the South would get weaker and weaker. The, uh, yeah. the invention of the cotton gin changed the economy of the southern states to the point where over time it was becoming more and more expensive for the states to retain slavery than to get rid of it. And moving into the Civil War, Civil War, you have this whole economic change taking place in the South as the, one of the main causes was the development of the cotton gin. They didn't need the manpower. Um, the, the cotton gin was, was developed, I think, around 1793. And it added to um, the ability of the South to, to, to grow cotton in, in lots of new places. And the number of slaves in the South grew tremendously in the decades that followed the invention of the cotton gin, even though the importation of slaves into the United States was prohibited after 1807. Um, that's point one. Second point is that there had begun in Virginia to introduce slaves into factories. The largest steel plant in the South had a significant number of blacks, slaves, working there. And slaves were also being introduced into things like mining in the South. It was not just growing cotton that was uh, was the way in which slaves were being used by way of their manpower. Well, we have time for one more question or comment, and then Michael will close the, uh, close the program, and we get on to refreshments. We have to, we're supposed to be out of here by 4 p.m. Is there another comment or question from anyone? Then uh, let's listen to Michael. I would like to thank you for demonstrating to us how creative a place the IRP can be for exploring issues and history. I'm really joined by two people who are so proud of this response. I want to thank 
Linda Friedman, player of many roles. Yes. Joe Zuckerman, John Becker, Michael Marsh, our panelist, and of course, Walter Wegline, who really made this labor of love. Thank you all for coming. We have wonderful programs uh, the rest of the season. If you want to find out about them, talk to us over there. And now to coffee. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I was saying, I forgot that he's been at the historical society. Oh, he's an archivist. Okay. Hey, thanks. I.